Well, last week we spoke about the peace of God and we saw that the peace of God is not a get well message. It's nothing less than his life, his very presence with us. For just as darkness is the absence of light, so we saw that the fear in the hearts of men and women is the absence of the presence of God. Now our Heavenly Father wants us to be so full of his spirit, his presence, that we know the sort of peace that the Apostle Peter knew. There is a description in Acts chapter 12 of Peter the night before he was due to be brought out to be executed. And there he was, chained in a jail in Jerusalem, uh, lying between two soldiers, and he's fast asleep. In fact, he's sleeping so soundly that the Bible says an angel has to give him a good thump to wake him up. That's the sort of peace that God wants us to know. And uh, you may be watching this morning and be thinking, but how, how can I experience this presence, this spirit that you're speaking of. And you know, the answer I have for you this morning is quite wonderful. It's the words of Jesus. He said this, my words are spirit and they are life. In other words, when the word of God is spoken, you can experience those words as God's presence in your life through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now I've lost count of the number of times where people have spoken to me about that very experience. They were listening to God's word and then they said, suddenly it seemed like God was speaking directly to me as if I was the only person there. And, and that's the experience I pray that you'll have today, even as you listen to God's word. You see, here's the most exciting thing to realize. God's word is living and active, the Bible says. It actually has the power to do something in your life. As you listen to the Word of God, uh, the Word can do a work in your life, a work of impartation. In other words, as you listen, you can receive from God's Spirit. Not only can you receive the reception of the peace of God, but also the faith of God. Now, this is such a wonderful truth that it is God's Word that does the work. That that truth can lift such a heavy burden off people. I know it's lifted a great burden off my life. You see, God does not expect you to produce faith. Isn't that amazing? Just think about that. Wow. He doesn't expect you to produce faith from within yourself. In fact, he doesn't expect you to produce love from within yourself either, or to produce hope from within yourself. In fact, the wonderful news is God isn't asking you to produce anything for he is the very one who's been trying to show you that in the words of Jesus, apart from me, you can do nothing. You see, he's not asking us to produce his good and holy life from within ourselves. He's asking us to bear his good and holy life in the same way that a branch bears fruit by being connected, connected to the vine, connected to the root, which is his life. I just quoted you part of John 15, verse five. Now listen to the whole verse. Jesus said this, I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, this is such good news to people who've been laboring under the heavy burden of self-effort or religion for years, where all we've heard about is what we need to produce for God. We're told you need to produce a holy life. You need to produce obedience. You need to produce a love for your enemies. You need to produce a self-control that pleases God. Now, during his earthly ministry, Jesus saw how the religious system of the day, overseen by the scribes and the Pharisees, placed such heavy expectations on people. Everywhere, he saw people who've been trying for years to produce what their religious leaders said was the level of holiness that God required them to produce. Now these experts in the law could quote off by heart all the commands of God and demand obedience to them. But two things were clear to Jesus and he repeatedly told these lawyers to their face these two things. First of all, he said, you are placing heavy burdens on people that are crushing them and you are not lifting one finger to help them. The second thing he told them was, you yourself are hypocrites. You're like whitewashed tombs, looking clean on the outside, but inside you're rotten because you give the appearance of living this life yourself, this good and holy life, but the truth is that none of you have this life within you. Now here's where religious folk make the same mistake today and we've all made it. 
because we're all religious. They take the commands of God and they put them on people in a way that infers that God expects you to be able to produce this holy life from within yourself by sheer willpower. But the law, the commands of God, were not given to enable people to produce God's goodness from within themselves. They were actually given to expose a lie. You could say the original lie that was planted in man, that you can become like God by what you do. The law was not given to reveal to people that they can become like God through their own willpower. It wasn't given to reveal that people have that power within them. In fact, it was given to reveal that people don't have that power within them. In the book of Romans, in chapter 3, we're told that in fact the law was given so that every mouth would be silenced and the whole world held accountable before God. In other words, the commands of God were not given so that men could boast that they can be like God. They were given so that every boasting mouth would be silenced. The commandments of God found in the law were not given so that man could discover how he can be like God by himself, but so that man could discover that by himself he cannot be like God. That in fact his inability to keep these commands, his inability to be good as God is good, would make him conscious that by himself is not the answer. By himself is the problem. His problem is that by himself, his separation from God, what the Bible calls his sin, that's the problem. Listen to how that's stated in Romans 3 verse 20. It says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Now, why does God want us to be conscious of our separation from him? Well, for the same reason that your doctor would want you to be conscious of a disease in your body that is killing you, so that you would receive the treatment that would save you. You see, the law, the commands of God are a bit like an x-ray that reveals the disease, but they're not the cure. You see, if the problem revealed is that you have been separated from the life of God, that you do not have the life of God within you, the cure for that is not to try and produce the life of God from within you. The only cure is to receive the life of God. You see, religion says you must produce for God. The gospel says you must receive from God. Now, last week we saw that the absence of the presence of God in men's hearts is like a darkness. Darkness is an absence, the absence of light. There is only one cure for darkness, and that is light. And there's only one cure for the absence of God's life, and that's the presence of God's life. So here is the good news of the gospel. Despite what you may have heard all your life, God's commands to live a good life were not given so that you could produce that life from within yourself. They were given, in fact, that you would come to the end of yourself. They were given so that you could see the truth that by yourself you can never be good as God is good because your self-life can only produce a selfish life. So his commands were given so that all your boasting and my boasting would come to an end and we would see that the only way we can have the good life of God is by receiving that life. Now, if you're not at that place yet, called the end of yourself, if you still believe that God expects people to produce this good life from within themselves by trying harder to do better, then what you're actually doing is boasting in yourself. Because if you seriously expect people to produce the life of God apart from the gift of God's own spirit, what you're saying is you think you have. You think that you became good and holy because of what you did and if only other people made the same sacrifices as you made and put their back into it a bit more, then they could lead good lives too. Well, you know, that boasting and that independent, proud heart will always find it difficult to receive from God who says that you must become as little children. He also says, I oppose the proud, but I give grace to the humble. People need to get to the end of their pride in order to receive from God, to allow the truth to dawn, to see in the light of the presence of God that your self-made goodness is like filthy rags compared to the gift of God's goodness that the Bible calls his righteousness that comes by the gift of his Holy Spirit. You know, one day 
there was a group of religious people who dragged a woman before Jesus who had been caught in the very act of adultery and they demanded that she be stoned to death for her crime because that's what the commandments said. Now, you can find that account in, in John chapter 8. Can you see that in that very act of doing that, of accusing her, they were boasting before God? You see, they were in effect saying, she's different to us. We have made ourselves acceptable to God, but she hasn't. But then Jesus, God incarnate, the very presence of God stood before them and he spoke and his words brought light. And he said this, Jesus said, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Now John's gospel describes what happened next. It says all this, well, it actually says at this those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Now, why the older ones first? Well, you know, in the light of God's presence, what men should see is that the longer you rely on self-effort, religion, to be like God, the less like God you become, not the more. It was the most religious who had dragged that woman before God for judgment. But the very God before whom they dragged her was the one who had come to save her life, not to destroy her life. How much does religious pride blind people to the heart of God, to what our Heavenly Father is really like? Well, just have a look across social media right now and you'll still find plenty of religious people who want to drag this world before a God whom they think wants to stone these sinners to death by coronavirus. Would the Holy Spirit not still say to such religious people what he said through the Apostle Paul to the Corinthians? Why do you boast like that? Listen to that full verse in 1 Corinthians 4.17 in the New Living Translation. It says, For what gives you the right to make such a judgment. What do you have that God hasn't given you? And if everything you have is from God, why boast as though it was not a gift? You see, boasting can only be done from a place of separation from God's grace. God wants no one separated from him. And that is why the Bible says that God's desire is that no one should boast. The Apostle Paul wrote those beautiful words to the Ephesians, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast, so that no one can boast. He was saying, this life of God is not from yourselves. This life God wants for you, a life of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, it's the gift of God. It's not a life achieved, it is a life received. It's not about your willpower. It's about your will empowered by receiving the gift of God's Spirit, His grace. You see, God's grace is not a thing that can be given like Moses gave the law. God's grace is His very presence. Grace and truth aren't things to be given. Grace and truth came in the person of Jesus and come to us today still by the person of the presence of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the fruit of the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life is described in Galatians 5, 22, 23. And it's the perfect life, the life you've always tried to do through willpower. Listen to what it says is the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and (laughs) self-control. Against such things there is no law. Isn't that amazing? All the virtues that we try to produce in our lives by willpower actually grow in your life when our lives are rooted in the presence of God. God does not ask us to produce fruit. He gives us the ability to bear fruit by being joined to His Spirit. For those who are joined to the Lord are one spirit with Him, the Bible says. Remember God's message to Mary given by the angel Gabriel. It was not Mary, you shall produce a child. Rather, it was Mary, when the Spirit ministers, you will bear a child. 
You see, God's not asking you to produce his good life, the most loving and generous life in the world. He's asking us to bear that life by being joined to him. And that brings us back to where we began. Because you may be watching this morning and be thinking, but how? I mean, how can I experience this presence, this spirit, this joining with God? And the wonderful answer I have for you today is still the words of Jesus. My words are spirit and they are life, Jesus said. In other words, when the word of God is spoken, you can experience those words as God's presence in your life through the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Romans 10, 17 tells us that faith is the gift of God that comes by hearing. I love that verse, you know. Very often, sometimes in the past, I've spoken to somebody, I remember very often speaking to my mother, you know, and, and she would listen and she would say, well, I wish I had your faith. And it's such a joy to be able to say, it's not mine. I didn't work it up from within me. Faith is the gift. It comes by hearing, hearing his word to you about Christ, about the generosity, the magnitude of the love of God. That's why I would say to all ministers of the gospel, don't tell people they need more faith. Give them more of the gospel that brings faith, praise God. So this truth that God's word carries the power to do a work in your life is such good news for those of us who spent a lifetime doing all we can with all our strength, but never finding lasting peace or freedom from fear. To experience God's word doing what we could not do is the beginning of understanding what Jesus meant when he said, my burden is easy my yoke is light. You see, where religion demands faith, God supplies faith. It comes by hearing the gospel. Not only is the faith of God imparted to us through his words to us, but his love comes to us too. For you cannot separate faith and love. And his love is the first fruit of his spirit in us. Love is the true expression of faith. And I pray that today, through this message, you have begun to experience the Spirit of God speaking directly to you. And as you become aware of how awesome that is that God would speak to you, that you become aware in the same moment of his call on your life to turn away from living by yourself and trying to produce a good life by yourself and instead come to the end of yourself, all you're doing, and simply receive as a little child would what God is doing in your life through his word to you today. Receive what God's word is doing in your life, revealing to you that God is love and love must come in person. He is the God who has never been interested in religion, but in relationship. And he, his life he has always wanted for you it was never the life of an orphan who feels abandoned, but it was the life of a child who feels loved, who knows the love of a father. Let's pray. Oh, Father in heaven, I thank you today for the power of your word that sets us free from self, that sets us free from isolation, from separation, that presence yourself in our life in such a way that we never have to live alone again. Father, I think of your servant Abraham who it says came to a point in his life where he stopped trying to make himself right and he entered into the life that you were making for him and that was a turning point in his life. And I pray today for a great turning point in many lives today. As we see things around us, all of our doing perhaps in our own strength falling apart, that we would in this moment experience your presence with us and to know that when you're with us, we can go through anything because if you are for us, who's against us? So thank you, Lord, that your word today is doing a great work. And I pray for many open hearts to receive that good seed in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for listening today and for watching. If something you heard resonated with you today, if you felt God speak to you today and you want to get in touch, please feel free to do that. You can do that through the platforms of YouTube and Facebook. Go to River City Church Ireland or email us at info at rivercityapostolic.org. God bless you.